Hello guys, Future Jade here. I know what you're all thinking, why am I uploading a video about a season that ended a good two months ago, right now? And an answer to that question is actually down in the description. I didn't want to bog down this already really long video by explaining why it's so late at the beginning, because that would have taken about five or ten minutes knowing me and how much I ramble. So I just wanted to flag it up at the beginning of the video so you could pop down into the description and have a read and then just let you watch the video and hopefully enjoy it, which is what I'm going to do now in that same vein. So watch away. Jade, otherwise known as Scarlet Rebel, and today I'm going to share some of my thoughts and opinions on Season of Dawn in Destiny. So a couple of things to bear in mind before we get started. So first of all, I would consider myself a casual player. I have said in the past that I play maybe less than 10 hours a week, and honestly it's probably even less than that. Still, that doesn't mean I don't enjoy this game. Um, I did manage still to get the saviour seal for this season, so that kind of tells you that even though I consider myself a casual player, I do play it a lot and obviously have a lot of opinions on it. <laughs> Today's day is the 3rd of March, so as far as I'm aware, all the content for Season of Dawn has come out. The last thing that came out was obviously the ending of the Empyrean Foundation with Charles Osiris. And then the last kind of housekeeping thing is that I was going to have, I've basically broken down this video into different sections of different aspects of the season that I want to talk about. And I was gonna have a season that was just gonna be exotics. So I was gonna talk about Bastion and Devil's Ruin. But seeing as I already have a Devil's Ruin video, that link will be up here or up here somewhere um <laughs> lots of links are going down in the description from this video i feel like um but yeah i made a video talking about my feelings on devil's room because i was very passionate about people's kind of criticisms of it so you can go watch that if you like and seeing as this was going to be a video or at the very least i was also going to do a separate video about bastion and the corridors of time i figured rather than just break it all up i would put a section in here about the corridors of time and about Bastion and everything that happened around that um, and kind of talk about that later on in this video. So before we dive into the sections, let me just very quickly recap what happened in Season of Dawn. So what's really cool about all the seasons that have come out post Shadowkeep is that they all kind of branch into each other narratively. So the first season that we got um, after Shadowkeep was um, Season of the Undying. The Season of the Undying was all about the Vex and how they were trying to invade the moon and kind of push on Guardian territory. The moon is obviously the closest planet to Earth, so if they managed to overtake it, that was gonna be bad news bears, especially if they were able to take it from the hive of all horses. So Ikora devised a plan to create a portal to get Guardians into the Black Garden, which is basically the birthplace of the Vex. And using that portal, we managed to find every single timeline where a certain Vex called the Undying Mind existed and killing the Undying Mind as many times as possible in many different timelines made it so that we could pull the Vex back from the moon essentially, make them lose some power. However, <laughs> in messing with the timelines and using the portal and everything that Ikora did with that, we ended up creating a certain timeline that Osiris ended up seeing. So Osiris saw a timeline in which there was a pyramid above the city and the city had been laid to waste and that was kind of a new timeline or a new end time that he had seen. Running concurrent to that, the Cabal had found a device that he had built called the Sundial. The Sundial is a machine that he built in order to help him navigate the corridors of time, specifically on Mercury, in order to try and save a legendary guardian called Saint-14. Saint-14 and Osiris were, are, it's kind of up in the air as to how they are right now, but <laughs> um, they have a history, they were very close they're lesbians, Carol. <laughs> oh, they're lesbians, Harold. I think that's the phrase. <laughs> um, so yes, yeah, so Osiris basically was trying to help save Saint-14 because his death was on Mercury. He was trying to use a sundial not to do that. But the remnants of the Red Legion, because yes, they're still around, um, found the sundial and overtook it and overtook Mercury and basically were trying to use a sundial to brute force an ending where Gaul actually ended up winning the Red War. So Osiris comes to the Guardians and basically asks us to help him keep the sundial in control, beat off the Cabal, but in the process we actually end up helping to save Saint-14. Our messing around in the sundial, in the timelines, are messing around 
in the timelines from Season of Undying, it all managed to create a timeline or a fraction of time or something like that wherein we were actually able to save Saint 14. It didn't exist before. Osiris built the sundial in order to save Saint, but he could never find a timeline in which he could save him. But thanks to us, because we are the Guardian, and part and parcel thanks to Ikora as well, because she was so determined to kill the Undying Mind and switch up the timelines, we managed to save Saint 14, who, if you played Destiny 1, you know how big a legend, how big a character Saint 14 is. Even if you didn't play Destiny 1, you probably saw the helm of Saint 14 around, you would have known about him. And he's back in the tower. But the story doesn't end there. So Osiris, as well as seeing this new timeline of end times, asking us to help him with the sundial and the cabal that are um, basically invading it and trying to use it, he also enlists our help to keep these things called obelisks around the universe up and running. The obelisks basically help to root the sundial in different timelines. The more powerful they are, the easier it is to use them in order to traverse the corridors of time and use the sundial and etc etc. And Osiris gives Saint some instructions on how to put one in the tower and Saint sets about to use that obelisk to create a beacon to bring other guardians home I think is how he said it or to kind of light a beacon for several people and I mean spoiler alert but that ended up being a big community event and the beacon itself ended up creating Twas Osiris that makes no sense at all but that's kind of how the quest ended. So the kind of basic story beats are that in the season one dying or at the end of it we create new timelines Osiris noticed this and asked us to help him keep the sundial free of Cabal. And then because we'd changed the timeline around so much, we were actually able to go into the corridors of time and save Saint 14, which is something that Osiris previously couldn't do before we'd killed the Undying Mind. When Saint 14 comes back to the tower, um, he helps us get a couple of guns first and foremost. <laughs> and then he enlists our help to create a beacon which will help guide other guardians home and in turn that creates the trials of Osiris. So now to break down my kind of main thoughts on the season. The first thing we're going to talk about is the story slash the law. So there were a couple of law books that came out with this season but I'm also going to talk about the main story beats in more depth and kind of how I feel about them. So before the season came out we got quite a few narrative previews on the Bunch website. If you haven't read them, if you're not aware of them, Sometimes before seasons, the narrative team will upload narrative previews, which are essentially kind of like little stories on the Bungie website that help to kind of lead you into the season. They're not necessarily like required reading or anything like that, none of the law is, but similar again to any of the law, they just help to give you a little bit of a better idea of what's going on in the world and help kind of prepare you for the story beat going into the season. For example, everything I mentioned earlier about Osiris finding lots of different timelines to try and save Saint 14. He says that a few times during the season at the very beginning when you're getting quests from him but he doesn't really expand on it and it's in one of those stories where you learn a little bit more about that. So there were four or five, I can't quite remember, um, I think they were dropped like in the week leading up to when Season of Dawn um, dropped basically. They were really really good, they helped to shed a lot more light on who Saint 14 was when he was alive, the kind of things that he did. I loved, loved the characterisation and the aspect of him having all these purple ribbons and how each one of them represented a life he had saved. I thought that that was amazing and really cute and a lovely aspect of his character. Osiris trying so so desperately to get Saint 14 back, consistently saying in multiple entries that he deserves to be brought back to life. Even if you played during Curse of Osiris, the mission where you get his shotgun, you know how much he meant to Osiris. And as a small side note, as long as we're talking about story and characters, I just really honestly truly believe that Osiris and Saint 14 do share a love for each other. Yes, I am a queer person. Yes, I do ship people of same sex. That doesn't really have any bearing on the fact that I just truly believe that these are two men that love each other. There's a lot more to be said there about their relationship and maybe it's more information for another video, but I just feel like with the narrative previews and with everything that Osiris does in Season of Dawn, it's clear to see that he regretted Saint Fourteen's death, potentially thought that he had a hand in it because at the end of the day Saint Fourteen went to the Infinite Forest chasing Osiris, trying to bring him back even though Os Osiris had been exiled and had essentially turned his back on the tower and Saint and Saint still went after him. It's quite heartbreaking, it's very bittersweet. The way Osiris is written in the narrative previews reflects that wonderfully and it's just so warming and so lovely and again there's a bigger conversation to be had about LGBT rep and stuff like that in this game, 
don't get me started on the palaver that happened over Crimson Days. I'm, I'm, I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. <laughs> but, you know, Bungie does have a handful of queer coded characters, which is great. They have um, canon queer characters, none of which have like one part of their couple which is dead, which is great. But I do truly believe that even if they're not telling each other in the game that they love each other, that Osiris and Saint 14, however you want to look at it, platonically, romantically, or just as comrades, for lack of a better term. <laughs> These are two men who really love each other. And yes, I know that, you know, Saint calls Osiris brother and stuff like that and blah, blah, blah. It's just a name, it's just a friendly name. And I think it's kind of a cheap scapegoat for you to kind of argue that there's a chance that they're both straight. If you're really, really so offended that people would insinuate that they are in love with each other more than just two dudes being guys. <laughs> Again, for me, I see it as being very romantic because there was a lot of kind of bittersweet longing from Osiris's point of view and again as a queer person I really do identify with that but anyway I'm not gonna let this turn into a rant the kind of missed spaces and the space in between and the longing that comes from the narrative previews and the way Osiris and Saint talk about each other in the game in the quest steps in voice lines is really really interesting really really cool and I'm really really glad that they went down that route with it you know what I mean like I appreciate that it was Osiris desperately trying to get him back and not something else that would have just been oh we need to revive Saint 14 you know like it just it had a lot more heart to it and I really liked it and then the two lore books that we got um we had one called Constellations and then we had another one called The Pigeon and the Phoenix. So Constellations is basically, I mean, first of all, it's an amazing lore book. It gives us a lot more insight into the speaker, who if you never played Destiny 1 or if you've only heard about him a little bit, the speaker, as we were told, was someone who spoke about the Traveller. But the Constellations book actually gives us a better insight into what the speaker could actually do, which was not hear the Traveller, actually, spoiler alert. And we actually learn as well something really important, which is that that speaker wasn't the only one. There were several speakers, and there have been several speakers, who are basically kind of written as if they're light touched, like ghosts will follow them and escort them to the tower, and you know, the current speaker will train another one who's been having dreams and visions because that's the only way that the traveller can communicate to them. There's really cool conversations that include people like Tula the Fairwind. There's just lots of characters from the Dark Ages, from the City Ages, characters who don't really get their own like kind of light to shine. It's a fantastically amazing amazing book. It's one of those books that's really good to give you like an insight of the world of Destiny and again amazingly written, really really good stuff. The other one was The Pigeon and the Phoenix. Now I will be honest I have skim read over this one. I haven't really read it quite intensely only because um, I have <laughs> Honestly, I have a little bit of a negative connotation to it just because it took so long to get in the game. If you've got the law book in the game, you'll know that you had to run through the corridors of time and follow all these different patterns and follow all these different codes in order to get all of the pages, um, which I didn't mind doing, but I just haven't, it's kind of turned me off to sitting down and, and reading it, you know? Which doesn't take away from the fact that it's a great book. Even just skim reading over it, I can tell that it's still amazingly written. One other thing to bear in mind as well is that it is one of those books that has like, logs like communiques between people. It's not actually that hard to read between the lines though, not as hard as other law books. Say like the war mind stuff and things of that nature. But again, you know, going back to everything I was rambling about earlier with Osiris and Saints um, relationship, it really does kind of hunker down the feeling that they just cared so intensely about each other. And even more so that Saint 14 saw something in Osiris that not a lot of people did. He really saw hope. He really saw someone who could lead the city in Osiris. And yeah, if you're someone who enjoys their relationship or even goes so far as to, dare I say, ship them, God forbid. <laughs> yeah, if you ship them, if you like them together, definitely read this book. It's heartwarming, heartbreaking, <laughs> and it does give you a little bit more insight into Osiris's first steps as a guardian and saints as well from what I remember. So section two, the activities during Season of Dawn. First of all, I thought Sundial was really, really fun. I thought it was a definite improvement of Effects Invasion. And I'm really glad that with all the complaining I saw about the Sundial, the final boss ended up surprising and delighting a lot of people. I did think the last boss was really, really cool. The fact that all three of the Scions combined together to create one and you had to kill each version of them still. It was just, it was a really, really good way to switch it up and I don't think a lot of people were expecting it. And, you know, a lot better than just kind of having a bullet sponge undying mind at the end of this kind of wave type thing. One thing I will say about both Vex Invasion and Sundial is that 
all of the environments were absolutely stunning. Moving through the Black Garden and Rex Invasion was really, really, really cool. And going to past, present, future, and then the corridors in Sundial was also really, really amazing. The fights were good. The point system was good. The legendary version of it was really, really hard. Was it hard? I mean, I did it in one go. <laughs> it was challenging, which is all you really want. And I really enjoyed it. I like Sundial a lot. It's not necessarily, you know, something that I'm going to be sad is going, same with Vex Invasion, but it was really good and it was definitely an improvement, I feel. So then the only other thing to talk about activity-wise is the obelisks. So first things first, the time loss bounties I think were a fantastic idea. In the end, when you were donating Fractaline into the main obelisk in the tower, they were a really, really, really good way for people to grind out god rolls for like different weapons and stuff like that or even just like rolls that they preferred um, I ended up doing that mostly to use the bounties for XP to level up my season pass but I ended up getting a lot of different weapons, I ended up learning a lot more about different perks and kind of trying out different things so even as a casual player the time loss bounties were really cool for just kind of taking a step back and actually looking at perks and weapons and things like that and kind of trying to figure out what suits me and what I like a lot. That being said with the obelisks overall, the charged by light perks that you could get from each of them, I never used any of them and I don't think I'm the only person. It's not necessarily that I didn't understand them, they just never had perks big enough to make me think oh let me equip this and try it out. Like you know when you go to a party and there's like food on the table but you've already eaten before you came so you're like oh I guess I'll just nibble at that later but then you get towards the end of the party and you're going home and you realise that you didn't actually have like anything from the table. It felt like that kind of. It was a cool idea which I didn't put into practice so maybe I did miss out on something but I know a lot of people who didn't use any of the charge by light mods or anything like that. I don't feel like I missed anything by not using them so they were just kind of there. That would be one kind of constructive criticism I guess I would have is that like I don't feel like the perks or the charge with light thing in general really stood out to me. There was nothing there that made me go, oh, oh, I should definitely use that. There was also a lot of text on those mods as well, um, and maybe that's just my ADHD brain, but <laughs> I just was like, da -da 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 more heavy ammo, I guess put it in my inventory and then just never equip it, was kind of my experience with them. I'm also not 100% sure if I ever really felt the extra perks that you got from the obelisks. Like when you upgraded them and it was like get more glimmer from killing fall and get more um, fractaline from doing gambit and crucible. I mean the fractaline stuff I don't doubt but when it came to little things like picking up materials and glimmer I, I never noticed a massive difference. I mean there probably was a massive difference and maybe it's good that it was casual under the radar but you know I still had to go to spider for glimmer, I still had to buy materials from him so it was never again like a huge huge difference and again you know casual players so maybe that's one reason why I didn't too. I am however extremely grateful that all of the bounties from all of the obelisks ended up collating into one in the tower that was such a good idea thank you Bungie for that and I liked the concept of fractaline a lot the fact that you would go around the universe and do different activities gather fractaline and then put it back into the obelisks to upgrade them um, the fact that that ended up feeding into an and foundation at the end um, was really cool too um, I like that concept I hope that Bungie do more with it it was just fun it was rewarding it was um, satisfying as well to be able to like complete a nightfall or do gambit for an hour and then take all the fractaline that I'd collected and put it into an obelisk and then in general um, I always always love and hope that this continues in the next season how the tower changes every single season with like you know you have the portal in season one dying and you have the obelisks um obelisk even in the tower um and everything that changes around the world as well i do really like the fact that it's just little things that change in the world every now and then because it reminds me a lot of things that happened in destiny one with the um wolves bounties that happened right before um House of Wolves dropped, there was stuff that happened before Dark Below came out as well. You know, mysterious stuff like that that doesn't last very long and you get special rewards from doing. I loved that. I loved that so much in Destiny 1. I'm glad it's kind of coming back in Destiny 2. Um, I am going to be talking a little bit more in a separate video about how seasons are changing and the whole FOMO thing, fear of missing out if no one knows what that means, and how Bungie are trying to make it so that, you know, the seasons feel less like that, which I do appreciate, but there are certain aspects such as like the world changing that I think are really cool and even as a casual player would like to see more of these kind of special things that oh I was walking around the EDZ and this 
fall and popped out and you know etc etc stuff like that and then the next section is all about the corridors of time so here we go now i understand that you know people's aggravation and general negative feelings about this have died down because it happened so long ago but i still really want to talk about it because i had a lot of opinions about it especially when it comes to kind of you know, my feelings on gamer entitlement and stuff like that. So for those of you who don't know, there was a weekly reset where when you went to visit Osiris at the Sundial, the little tablet that would let you into the corridors of time was active and no one really knew why. It was one of those events where there was no guide, there was no roadmap, no one was telling you what to do, it was just a secret little thing that Bungie were waiting for all of us to figure out. And it turned out to be this big community event. I've said that a lot about this season, which I do really like about it. There's been a lot of collaboration by all kinds of people, streamers, content creators, casual players such as myself. So how did the Corridors of Time work? Essentially, all of the obelisks around the world, um, every hour would change and have a different sequence of symbols on them. When you walked into a new section of the Corridors of Time, there would be five different dolls that would each have corresponding symbols. And you would basically have to like, connect the dots with the symbols to go through this corridor. When you came to the very, very end, you would press X on like a question mark thing, look underneath you and another set of symbols would be created. And you would also gain the law of peace, which is where a lot of my kind of frustration with reading the Pigeon and the Phoenix law book came from, because that was how you acquired that law book in the game, was to do that about 15 or 16 times. So this pattern, this sequence, this puzzle ended up being huge, ended up being really, really big. And there was 16 law book pages, but also a certain sequence that would unlock a emblem. And when you went to that final room to unlock the emblem, one, the emblem code, when you looked underneath and saw that particular pattern, you would have to take that pattern and put it next to several other people's to create a pattern that would lead you towards an exotic weapon, which ended up being Bastion. So no one knew that it was gonna be Bastion until they actually figured out the puzzle and it took a couple of weeks, maybe three weeks to figure it out. You know, I won't lie, it was spearheaded by a lot of streamers, a lot of people who had the time to collect information and put it all together, but it was a community effort because even the person who is just playing for a couple of hours after putting the kids to bed, their code would have, you know, contributed to this big pattern. There was obviously a lot of hype whilst it was being solved. A lot of people thought that because in the last room there's what looks like a grave with a ghost and a sword in the um, coffin that we were going to get one of the exotic swords back from Destiny 1. So a lot of people were speculating about it, a lot of people very rightly figured out that it ended up being our grave, the Guardian's grave. And you know, at the end of a couple of weeks, the weapon that we got at the end of it ended up being Bastion and people had opinions. <laughs> so one thing to know if you didn't play Season of Dawn, if you didn't catch up with it, is that Bastion was an exotic weapon that was on the roadmap as a quest. So everyone knew this weapon was coming, everyone knew that we were going to be getting a quest to acquire this weapon at some point, but because we figured out this surprise puzzle two weeks in advance, everyone who completed the puzzle at the end got the weapon. A lot of people were calling this lacklustre and disappointing. And I really, really want to talk about what Bungie originally envisioned for the puzzle because they did talk about it when it was solved. They put up a post an article talking about what they wanted from the puzzle itself and how they wanted the community to interact with it. But before I get into that, I just want to say that I felt like a lot of people's reaction to getting an exotic weapon two weeks early for doing nothing more than walking around a few corridors was very entitled like that guy in his motorcycle riding past my flat as I'm filming, very entitled. <laughs> it's, it echoes a lot of stuff that I said in my Devil's Room video about how I understand that the top of the top of the top and the, and the people who play all the time want to, you know, dig their teeth in and work hard and get an amazing reward. And because this thing was such a secret and no one knew about it until it happened and it took so long to make and Bungie were being really secretive about it. They were expecting, you know, an exotic sword or something new or something like brand new that was gonna like blow their minds. And it ended up being an exotic that everyone was expecting. However, the community event itself was really, really fun. It was really, really cool. And even if you didn't touch the corridors of time at all, you could still get the weapon. When the puzzle was fixed, um, fixed. <laughs> when the puzzle was solved, Bungie made it so that you could pick up the quest immediately from Saint 14 in the next reset, so no one was missing out. It again created a lot of memes, it created a lot of fun, it created a lot of talk. 
It reminded a lot of people of puzzles from Destiny 1 that people really enjoyed. I always, always love when Bungie put secret things into the game. I'm a really, really big fan of the time trials like Zero Hour and The Whisper of Worm. I remember when Zero Hour happened actually, I remember being online with my friends and we managed to get it and we've never been able to do anything secret like that ever. So being able to have that experience was amazing. Something else I wanted to mention as well was that I saw a lot of people commenting on how this was gonna be a big event that casual players were gonna benefit from because people who played all the time were doing all the work and putting all the work in and casual players were just gonna pick up this weapon. And again, it's that attitude that I hate, I can't stand it. And it actually is something that happened a lot over Season of Dawn. It happened in the Devil's Ruin quest, it happened with Corridors of Time. The only thing it hasn't happened with is Trials because it feels like the loudest people in the community who complain the most. <laughs> we're in it in Jane, we're in it in. <laughs> you wanna make friends. <laughs> It feels like a lot of people who were, you know, dissatisfied with this season were satisfied once Trials was announced, which is absolutely fine. But considering you had to send in your code, everyone was sending in their emblem codes to all the streamers who were trying to figure it out, everyone was taking the time to participate and try and help out where they could. The fact that you look at all of that and say, oh, casual players are going to benefit from all the hard work that streamers are doing, you've completely missed the point of the Corridors of Time puzzle. You completely miss the point of this community event and the kind of puzzles that Bungie do. The kind of puzzles that Bungie do are never supposed to benefit one person or one group of people. They're always supposed to be community-wide, a bunch of people coming together to figure it out and have fun doing so. Whether that's a casual person who hasn't had a chance to play, watching a streamer do it or watching live tweets and stuff like that, or a streamer realising that something secret has happened and jumping straight into it. That is the whole point of the puzzles and a lot of my kind of bad feelings surrounding Corridors of Time came from a lot of people feeling entitled. You know, these events do sometimes bring out the worst in the community, but they do also bring out the best. The best being streamers like Glad, who I'm pretty certain didn't sleep for a week <laughs> and was constantly begging people and getting other streamers involved to try and put this puzzle together. T-Rex, who I watched do it when the um, puzzle dropped, he was really entertaining to watch, he really stuck with it for as long as, you know, he felt like he was able to and he was entertaining with it the whole time. So yeah, whilst I feel like the reward was perf perfectly adequate because we figured out a hard puzzle and managed to get an exotic two weeks early, there are a lot of people who don't feel that way and if you felt a negative way about it, I would just say take a step back and think about what the puzzle itself was trying to achieve. And what Bungie were trying to achieve, they actually say it in the article, and they say, when we started planning the puzzle, we created few goals to guide our development. Create a time maze through which any player can dive to discover secrets and lore. Serve as a shared community puzzle that rewards the exotic fusion rifle. And celebrate community achievement and invite all players to partake in the reward. So considering that was their goals, or those were their goals, and it wasn't about giving a stupid, overly powered exotic weapon, or praising streamers or blah 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 blah. I think they nailed it. I think they nailed it. I think it was really fun. It was really cool to watch and it was really cool to, you know, partake in when I got the chance to. They also do mention, what do they say? The bones originated several years ago with the discovery of the sleeper simulant and the ensuing quest to unlock it. They talk about how discovery is something that is reserved for a few people who are online at the time. And the same thing goes for the Whisper and the Zero Hour mission for the exotics for um, Outbreak Perfected and Whisper of the Worm. Which meant that when they were creating this one, they wanted to create a puzzle in which everyone could be included. It didn't have to be like, you know, you're online at the same time or you're online at the right time. Which again, I think they nailed and I think they did really, really well. And I unfortunately can't compare it to any of those things apart from Zero Hour because Zero Hour was the only one that I took part in on the day and I certainly can't compare it to you know Outbreak Prime back in Rise of Iron that big puzzle but again I remember just watching people do it and being really connected to it. With this puzzle in particular Bungie wanted to make something that was like everything they'd done before but more people could contribute to and get you know, law and cool things from without having to feel like they had to be there at the right moment or put aside tons of time in order to do it. And with those being their goals, I think they nailed it. And I just wanted to highlight that for people who maybe felt a way about the quest, that that was what they wanted it to be. And I don't personally, again, as a casual player, feel like getting exotic two weeks early 
was a detriment or a bad thing. I was actually really grateful for it. And before I rant any more about it, I'll leave it there. <laughs> and then the last two things we have to talk about, hopefully before my battery runs out, is the Emprian foundation and the Charles Voss Iris. So when it comes to the Emprian foundation itself, the kind of process of everyone investing and donating and trying to hit these goals, I have very mixed feelings. On the one hand, I thought it was really cool, I thought it was really fun. We had memes, we had stonks, we had glad never sleeping and invest versus donate and DMG was being away about it as well and I, just, I thought it was really fun. I thought it was really, really fun. I personally just invested into um, one obelisk to get it as far up as I could and then took um, the amount that the tower generated um, before reset, waited for reset and then put everything back into the obelisk if that makes sense. I don't actually think I explained that well. Basically I invested all week and then donated what I got during reset or after reset. I donated whatever the tower obelisk spit back out at me is what I'm saying. <laughs> my only thing that was slightly confusing and I would guess would be my criticism, constructive criticism hopefully, was that I was expecting and I was definitely under the impression and there was nowhere that was making me feel that this wasn't going to be the case that Trials of Osiris or whatever we were going to get, I mean we all knew it was going to be Trials, but that Trials was going to drop the second we hit the goal. You had DMG, you had a lot of people from Bungie um, kind of saying donate, donate, donate and we kept seeing graphs of how quickly it was going up so I don't understand, you know, why Trials had this set date and was going to become an event I mean, it, it, it seemed like it was forecast to come out with Season of the Worthy. If it was definitely gonna come out with Season of the Worthy, why were we donating to unlock it? I just feel like it would have generated more hype if it was confirmed or there was, or if it actually, I mean, I mean, it had enough hype behind it. I don't know what I'm saying. What I'm saying is I was slightly disappointed that, you know, Trials didn't drop straight away. And obviously I understand that that's not, you know, logistically possible because it would have had to be like, the concurrent Friday, so if we'd have hit it on a Friday, that would have been hard for them to do. If we'd have hit it on a Thursday, that would have been really hard for them to do. But it really just, everything they were saying, the way they talked about it, the way it was introduced into the game, made it seem like the second we hit that goal, Charles of Osiris was gonna drop. And that wasn't the case, and maybe that's me looking too much into it, but I just, the only other, you know, plus that I got out of donating Fractaline was XP for my season pass, which you know what? Yeah, that was really, really good. That was a really quick way to level up my season pass right at the end there. I think I got like five levels really, really quickly just from doing all of my factory and all of my glimmer and etc. etc. So that was, you know, again, beneficial for me as a casual player. But that was really the only benefit that I got out of it, and that wasn't the point of it, if you get what I mean. Or at the very least, um, if you're gonna create a thing where there's gonna be a donation, there should be something that drops you know, like maybe, you know, drop a story mission or a quest for a secret gun or something like that, or law or, I don't know, a strike, I don't know, something like that. And then say, oh, and by the way, because you've done this, Charles is also coming back, I guess. Because it really just felt like what we actually physically unlocked was a cutscene, because it felt like Charles was always gonna come back. Like if we'd have unlocked it two weeks earlier somehow, would it have still be coming out on March 13th? If we were still donating now, would they have extended it? and would Trials be coming out later? It just seems like we were donating for an announcement, which, you know, again, then the only physical thing that I got was was XP out of it. And I've talked a lot about gamers feeling a tile, so I'm trying not to make it sound like, well, why didn't I get Trials straight away, blah, blah, blah. You're about to hear in a second me talk about Trials, and I'm not a massive PvP person or Trials person at all. I just have a lot of very strong feelings about the way people conduct themselves in Trials of Osiris, so it's nothing like that. I just feel like, objectively, we were told to donate, and we would get a thing when we were done donating, but the thing that we got seemed like it was always planned for a certain date. So I just... I feel like it could have been more, you know, something like that, just a little bit more, like, like put another filling in that burger, like it's, it's good, but I want it to be better, you know? That being said, you know, Trials as a reward was really cool, getting that announcement itself was cool to see, which brings us on to the last and probably the most important part <laughs> this entire video. Trials of Osiris is returning in Destiny 2, finally. So first things first, very very quickly, the cutscene where you put Osiris's lantern into the bigger lantern, that was really cool. In general I've been loving all of the cutscenes that kind of weave into the story through the seasons and I really really hope Bungie keep doing that, not just for like next season, the season after, but like through Destiny 2. I want to, you know, log in every week and 
thinking to myself, am I gonna see a cutscene? Is something gonna happen? And when I do get really excited. And then in general, as far as Trials of Osiris goes, I mean, we knew. <laughs> Second we saw it in Foundation, a lot of people were theorizing that it was gonna come back and it did, which I'm really happy for. A lot of people have been crying out for it for a really long time. It's a fun 3v3 PvP activity and it's gonna give PvP players a lot more to do than just Iron Banner. So I'm really happy it's coming back. I'm happy it's a weekend event. You know, I think it's gonna be really cool to be able to just tune into any streamer on a Saturday. Well, not any streamer, but the majority of them and see them playing Charles of Osiris again. It's gonna give me that really good, like, nostalgic feel. That being said, um, I never played it in Destiny 1. I am really excited to potentially try in Destiny 2, but I don't know how well that's gonna go. I fare pretty well in Crucible. Um, my KD tends to go positive most of the time, not to brag or anything. Um, <laughs> um, I'm a good invader in Gambit, but obviously, you know, Gambit and Crucible too completely do different things. Completely. Completely different things. You can tell how nervous I am just talking about trials because it's so like, it's such a thing for people. One thing I'm concerned about is the light level advantage because that was something that made Trials of the Nine back in the day when Destiny 2 first released. Um, if you don't know, there was Trials of the Nine, which was Destiny 2's attempt at Trials of Osiris. Yeah, and this was back when all PvP was 4v4, so they made Trials of the Nine to kind of be the Trials of Osiris, but it wasn't the Trials of Osiris. There was a light level advantage made a lot of things very not fun. And I remember firstly going into Trials of the Nine, like first run on a weekend and coming up against flawless players like immediately. It was difficult, it wasn't very fun. But one thing that I will say though, is that they confirmed that they're going to be, um, that's what I'm looking for, disabling the seasonal artifact. The seasonal artifact being something that the more you level up, it gives you an extra light level. So for example, at the moment I have an extra 15 light levels on top of what I get from my armor and my gear, just because of the artifact. And you get a fresh new artifact to repower up um, every season. So they've confirmed that they're gonna be disabling that, not just for Charles of Osiris, but for Iron um, Banana, <laughs> for Iron Banner as well. I'm hoping, hoping that that levels out the playing field a little bit. Um, and I also, you know, think that that was really good on Bungie. That was a really fast way of listening to player feedback and they dealt with that worry very, very quickly. So good on them. Also, one kind of very main thing I wanna talk about, which I don't feel like a lot of people talk about is I am potentially turned off of the idea of Trials of Osiris because of, you know, the <laughs> very stereotypical, sweaty kind of toxic players. Even just playing Iron Banner, Crucible, you know, normal 3v3 elimination, even just playing Gambit, you know, there are tear baggers, there are people who will send you messages, there are people who will be and as a casual player, I feel like I run into it a lot more than I should. So this is just your general PSA. Don't be a sh** in trials. <laughs> trials is really hard. There are a lot of people who are probably, you know, maybe only gonna get a chance to play it for a night or play it for like a day with a couple of friends who can also get some free time. If you're coming up against a team and you're absolutely demolishing them, just don't be a sh**. Like, it's a game. And I know a lot of people will throw back at me, oh, but it's a game, so you shouldn't be you know, fussed or upset if I teabag you. But it's like, <laughs> a teabag or a message, you know, are disrespectful. And you are allowed to be upset that someone is disrespecting you in something as stupid as a game. Obviously there's a bigger conversation about don't let it ruin your entire night because again, it is just a game. But again, no one really talks about how there is this PVP mentality in Destiny, which isn't prevalent, not as prevalent as it is in games that are strictly online, cough, cough, dewy cough, but it can get bad. So if you're like me and you're a little bit scared of Trials of Osiris and you don't really want to go into it, um, all I will say is try it out. It could be fun. I did 3v3 elimination um, with my partner Tristan and my best friend Pin, and we had a good time even though we came up against toxic players. I am someone who, I don't hesitate to swing the um, the, the report button, you know, I normally just report people for um, disrespectful behavior. Uh, even if it doesn't work, even if it doesn't happen, it makes me feel better. I'm not saying report people who beat you, I'm not saying report people who are, you know, winning over you at a massive advantage. I'm saying if someone relentlessly teabags, if someone sends you a message that says that you suck or something like that, you know, don't, don't feel like you have to reserve some kind of PvP gamer cred and not report them. Report them. It, like, <laughs> don't worry about it. And again, if you are someone who played Trials in Destiny 1, if you are thinking of going back into in Destiny 2, just be respectful. It's a game, everyone is there to play, and this might seem like a really serious PSA, but the fact that I'm even having to say it should tell you how prevalent that kind of behavior still is, 
even if it isn't a problem. It's definitely not a problem in Destiny, but considering there are still big name content creators in the Destiny community who will tell someone to get over it if they're mad about teabagging, I just felt like it was prominent to say for someone with five subscribers. <laughs> and last but not least, thank you Bungie. Thank you Bungie for bringing back the original armor because all I ever wanted in Destiny 1 and the one thing that made me consider going into trials and begging people to play with me was the chest piece for the hunters. So thank you for bringing that back. I am so happy. Whoever made that decision, give them a raise. <laughs> I just said thank you, thank you, thank you. God, I love that chest piece so much and I'm so excited to maybe, maybe get a chance to get it. I really, really want it. And there we go. There are my opinions on Season of Dawn. I won't keep you for too much longer. My battery's running out and as you can probably hear, my voice is starting to go as well. <laughs> I've been filming for about an hour and I've technically been filming all day as well. So my name is Jade, otherwise known as Scarlet Rebel. This channel is a place for me to talk about anything and everything that interests me, from video games to beauty to movies and comic books and D&D &D and just all kinds of things. Please consider subscribing if you'd like to see more of that. Um, all my links to my socials will be down in the description. If you're a big fan of Destiny, I tend to rant and talk about news a lot on Twitter, so please consider following me there. I hope you all have an amazing day. I hope you all enjoy the next season, season of Worthy. And if you have opinions and things to yell at me in the comments, feel more than free. And I just hope you all have an amazing day. Bye. So my eye look today is inspired by Saint 14, but I feel like you can tell that more from the blocky eyebrows I'm rocking.